I had someone ask me a very strange question recently and the question was about being and the qu person's question was how do I become aware of being? How do I know the sense of being within me? And it's a very strange question and one that's almost impossible to answer because being is the most fundamental experience a human being has and their mind is trying to grasp the experience in a way their mind can't and really doesn't need to because being is the basis of all their experiences they always are they feel that fundamental sense of existence at all times however this person was quite caught up in their own sort of ruminations mental masturbation in a sense and he had tied himself in knots to some extent he was really desperate to try and understand this what was this feeling of being and how could he sense it within himself so sometimes when a person is avoiding the obvious pointing out the obvious to them is an effort in futility so I used this analogy instead. I said to him, I said, are you aware that you have a naked body? And he said, yes. And I said, well, when the body is clothed, when you have clothes on, is it still naked? And he said, no. Then at that point, I'm not naked. I said, no, I'm not talking about you being naked. Is your body still naked? Is there still a naked body under the clothes? And he said, yes, there's still a naked body under the clothes. It's just not naked to the world, but it is naked. It has no choice but to be naked under the clothes. And then he asked me, but, but isn't, isn't that a contradiction? Isn't the definition of nakedness to have no clothes? And I said, yes. From a, from a social perspective or a language perspective, yes. Naked is what other people can or cannot see. <clears throat> so if you're clothed and they can't see your bare skin under the clothing, then all of it, then you're not considered to be naked. But we talk about the naked body. Under the clothes, your body is and always has been naked, just like the day it was born. So he understood this analogy. I said, well, that is fundamentally the experience of being. Being is the felt sense of existence, which is the naked body. And the experiences themselves, whether that is the experience of your personality, the experience of your thoughts, emotions, physical sensations you're having, opinions you hold, political opinions, religious opinions, opinions about your boss whom you hate, traveling the world, experiences of eating food of different varieties. All of that is the clothing that covers the fundamental experience of being, which is the foundation. Without a body, there's nothing to put clothes on. You need the physical form of the body to clothe. The verb to clothe means putting clothes on a body or a mannequin, but on something, on some form, pre-existing form. So all of these experiences we're having need some pre-existing foundation upon which they can happen, without which those experiences themselves would be abstract. There would be mental experiences. They would be like imagining you're going for a holiday or a holiday brochure, which is not the same thing as the holiday itself, or a photograph 
of Mount Everest, which is not the same thing as Mount Everest. Similarly, in order for an experience to be real, to happen, it can only exist if existence is the case. And existence is felt by the human being as a sensation of being, of existing. Really, they're just the same word. Are you aware that you exist? But at this point, I think I had him focus enough on my analogy that he wasn't caught in his own thinking mind. And so I, when I asked him, are you aware that you exist? He answered, yes. I said, do you need to think about that? And he said, no. Then how are you aware that you exist? He paused for a few seconds. His brain started going. I, I saw his, I could almost see the, the gears in his mind beginning to crank into over, over, into overdrive. And finally he answered, I don't know how I know that I exist. I just know that I exist. And I said to him, well, that knowing is the result of your awareness of your being. And he said, well, but that seems so basic. And I said, yeah, well, it is. It's extremely basic. It's so basic that it does not require any real intelligence or feats of spiritual enlightenment or great aware awareness or awakening to realize this fact. Every human being is fundamentally aware of their own existence. Every self-aware animal is fundamentally aware that it exists. Even animals that are not self-aware at some level are aware that they exist because they have to protect that existence and that is why they're motivated to survive. It just happens at an unconditional level. And in fact, that is what is driving your neurosis. That is what is driving your angst and your anxiety and your depression and your fear and your self-loathing is on some level, not only are you aware of your own existence, you're terrified of that existence ending. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an ending in the form of death, but it's an ending in the form of the experiences you want to have. Because you've begun to equate your experiences with being itself. You have begun to think of your personality and your being as being synonymous. You've begun to think of your thoughts and your being as being synonymous. Your emotions and being as being synonymous. The experiences and events of your life and the people in your life, your family members and all those relationships and your fundamental sense of being as being synonymous. And as a result, when any one of those experiences ends or appears to be ending, you become terrified because you begin to feel like you yourself are ending, that existence itself is ending, right? That is, that, is, that is really the fear we all have is everything is life and death. Every scenario we encounter is, becomes a life or death scenario. And that, is, that is true suffering because we confuse existence with the forms in which existence happens. And existence is a constant. It's always there. Existence exists. It has no choice but to exist. But phenomena are impermanent. That is their nature. Is the nature of phenomena to be impermanent? It's like the, it's like the river and rapids. The rapids are always changing, but the river is constant. The river keeps flowing. The river doesn't stop flowing. 
but the rapids change from second to second to second. Now, if while watching the river, one was to begin panicking that, oh, the rapids are moving downstream and they're, they're going to disappear and the river's going to be gone, well, that's a huge misunderstanding because that is what rapids do. They move, they constantly move and change. They cannot stop, yet the river is a constant flow. And you need those two because the river is comprised of the moving rapids, just as is this existence being is comprised of impermanent experiences. And the great misunderstanding is to confuse the two and try to find one's identity and to become grounded in the phenomena themselves, no matter how reliable those phenomena, right? It's like the difference between investing your money in the stock market, which is volatile, and investing your money in gold, which tends to be more stable. Well, just because gold is more stable doesn't mean that it lasts forever. It doesn't. It's just on a different cycle of impermanence than the stock market is. Similarly, some things end more rapidly than others. The, the life of a flower is typically much shorter than the life of a human being. But that doesn't mean the human being's life is impermanent, it, uh, is, is permanent, it just means that it is on a different scale of impermanence, but that's all it is. And so we live in a universe of impermanence, of different scales of impermanence, and we make the mistake of trying to evaluate impermanence on a relative scale by saying, well, this one experience is more permanent than the other experience. The other experience is way too fleeting. This one is a bit more reliable. And so then we start to hedge our bets on the experiences that tend to hang around a bit longer than others, whether they, those be relationships or investments or uh, objects or whatever it might be. And we, and we then make the mistake of confusing that slightly longer duration of existence, which is still impermanent, with the expectation of permanence. We say, okay, I will build my house out of bricks because the straw house will be blown away by the winds. The brick house will outlast the straw house. It will, mass will last many, many years. And that might be true, but eventually even the brick house will tumble. And when it does, our expectations will be dashed and we find ourselves suffering one, once more. And so no matter where you hedge your bets, eventually you are setting yourself up for failure as long as you are basing your fundamental identification in that area. Your sense of who I am is wholly invested in one of these areas where you are kind of hedging your bets. Now that's not to say identification won't happen anyways, we all do it. We are all somewhat identified with our relationships, our roles in society and all of that. But is that all we are identified with? Or is an aspect of ourselves grounded in a deeper sense of existence, in that being. Because as long as one is grounded, then no matter what happens in one's life, and things will happen, loss will happen, grief will happen, death will happen, and we will mourn, and we will grieve, and we will suffer, that is inevitable. But as long as we remain tethered, we remain grounded to our fundamental sense of existence, then that is like a tree whose roots have grown deeply into the soil. Then even if you trim its branches, and this happens every other summer, we have beautiful large trees in our backyard and the city comes by and complains that some of the branches are beginning to touch telephone wires and so they'll start hacking at these branches and pretty soon after you have a you have this 
beautiful tree looking partially amputated. But it's not for long because it grows right back because the tree is fundamentally rooted in the earth and its roots run deep and it can regrow those limbs once again. And we too will regrow those parts of our personality, those parts of our lives, those parts of experiences that have been amputated. We will regrow them in different ways, in new ways. And it can all be done and it all happens organically. But when a tree is uprooted, when it has no roots in the ground, or its roots run very shallow, and then you amputate it, well then there's a good chance a tree won't grow back, or it won't grow back in the same manner or in a healthy manner. And this is what ends up happening to people who are so wholly identified with their circumstances and their lives and personalities and have very, very, very little reference point to that fundamental, deep-seated sense of being within themselves. And so I said to this person, as long as you are always aware that there is a naked body under your clothes, then it doesn't matter what you're wearing because those clothes will always change. Sometimes they'll be too warm. Sometimes they'll be too cold. Sometimes your body will suffer heat. Sometimes it'll suffer cold. Sometimes it'll suffer discomfort or itchiness if the fabric is too rough. But under all of that discomfort and change and sensation, all of that, if you are aware that there is still a healthy body beneath it, then in a way, that suffering can be taken in stride.